All right, let us get started. Looks like only the brave showed up this morning. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so today, um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, an alternative to the scan that we talked about last time. Um, and it's something that's got better properties, but maybe it's not a better algorithm. We'll explain all that as we go through this, okay? But I, kind of just to fill your repertoire with different ideas in terms of how things are done in parallel, we're going to present an alternative way of doing a parallel scan, okay? So if you might remember from last time, a scan is just like a reduction, except what we're doing is we're calculating the reduction for all prefixes of the entire set of n input. Okay, so we'll go through that today. Um, before we start, any questions, comments, feedback? Okay. All right, well, let's just get into it then. Okay, so last time we talked about this particular variant of uh, parallel scan called the uh, Kogi Stone parallel scan. And the idea is that if we had n elements that we're trying to calculate a scan for, we can do it in parallel by essentially putting in a tree that's accumulating all the sums, right? So if the input is 31704163, then we're doing some steps with a bunch of threads. In fact, we're gonna have n threads, right? So if we have n input elements, we have n threads in the block that do these steps and what we end up with after all the threads are done is an output that corresponds to the scan. Three, three plus one, three plus one plus seven, three plus one plus seven plus zero, and so on and so forth. Right? And we proved to ourselves that if we did this, that it would take logarithmic steps, log n steps, which is much better than n steps, which is what we would do if we were doing a sequential version, right? The sequential version is trivial. In fact, it's so trivial, you can count the number of assembly instructions, maybe 10, 15, within that loop. But it's n steps, n loop iterations. Now, because it's a very simple sequential algorithm, what we're contending with is overhead in the parallel code. That is, if the parallel code has too much overhead, then even a log n improvement in runtime complexity doesn't amount to an overall reduction in runtime, unless n is very, 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 very large. Okay, so the overheads matter for this particular kind of algorithm. And again, coming back to my point, maybe a couple lectures ago, all the big parallelism, things like matrix multiply, convolution, yeah, we're gonna go after it. We're gonna get big speed ups when we do that. But then what remains are the pieces that are not quite as parallel or the parallelism is more complex, where we have to be very careful if we're gonna reap the benefit, okay? Anyway, and one of the things about this algorithm that we didn't find so favorable is that we've got, we have n inputs, we have n threads, and pretty much there's nothing we can do except keep 
those end threads occupied for log and time. Okay, so we end up having n log n. In fact, there's not much we can do because even if we did a more theoretical analysis uh, in terms of the number of threads that are active, it's still going to be something close to n log n. Okay, so in terms of the resources, this particular flavor of scan just requires n log n resources. You might be thinking, well, on a GPU, I create a block, I need that block for a logarithmic number of steps. Those threads are occupied anyways. I can't release them, right? So for example, thread zero really didn't do anything. But I have to, I have to kind of allocate it, right? I can't not take thread zero out of the block and let some other thread have it. Or is it, let some other block have it. Not in, this, not in NVIDIA GPUs anyway. So, yeah, for, for a GPU block oriented GPU like uh, NVIDIA GPU, we're stuck. Okay, but what we're gonna talk about today is something where, yeah, it's still, the pattern still looks like this n-threads, logarithmic time, but potentially we might be able to, on a non-GPU architecture, non-NVIDIA architecture anyways, maybe we can reclaim those threads because it's got better asymptotic resource utilization than n log n. Okay, that is today's point. We'll come back at the end of the lecture and we'll analyze. Any questions on this? Okay, good. Well, let's move on. So the idea we're gonna do is, is the, one of the problems here is when we go from step one, step two, step three, we double our stride, stride one, stride two, stride four, stride eight. What we're doing is we're reducing the number of active threads but we're not really dividing the number of threads. So if I sum all these up, these green things, asymptotically, it's still n. They sum up to n. I'm not reducing them fast enough. Okay, so today what we're gonna talk about is an approach where, yeah, we're, we're reducing the number of threads by half each time. And therefore, the asymptotic behavior is gonna be much better from a thread utilization perspective. Okay, and the idea here is we're gonna use balanced trees to do this. And this is an approach that came after the Kogi Stone multiplier approach, but it's still a hardware-driven multiplier idea that we're now gonna to apply to parallel scan, okay? And this particular idea involves two steps. We're gonna do a scan, we're gonna do what we call a pre-scan and a post-scan. Okay, but the trees that we're gonna build are gonna be uh, more balanced. The idea is, uh, uh, was proposed by Brent Kung, it's the Brent Kung uh, parallel scan Maybe not so relevant for GPUs, block-oriented GPUs, but in terms of parallel computing, more general parallel computing, is much better. It's got better properties than the Kogi Stone. Again, we'll come back to that. Here's how we're gonna approach it, okay? So like I said, we're gonna have two steps. This is step one. And step one looks really nice. In fact, it feels a little bit like our reduction. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with a bunch 
of active threads. Well, actually, I guess in this case, the X's are active inputs. Okay, so those are our inputs. And we will have, you know, let's say N inputs. We will have N over two active threads. Maybe I'll say it the other way. If we have N active threads, we'll have two N inputs. Okay. So the plus indicators there, we can think of those as the active threads. So let's say this is thread zero and this is thread one and thread two and thread three. And what thread zero is doing is adding x0 and x1 and x2 and x3 and x4 and x5 and so on and so forth. Okay, so that after the first step, what we have are these partial sums. Okay, one step, those four partial sums. Step two then kind of just carries forward. We have the number of active threads. In this case, only thread one and thread three are active. And we sum these two partial sums. So thread one ends up calculating the sum of x0 dot 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 x3. Thread three ends up calculating the sum of x4 dot 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 x7. So at this point, just at the end of step two, we just kind of take this as a slice. We have calculated output zero. We've calculated output one, calculated output two and three and four. Uh, sorry, I'm just, uh, no, we don't have four yet. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Hang on a bit, okay. So that's where we are after that step. Okay, um, then one more step and one active thread and that particular active thread calculates x0 dot 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 x7. Okay, here's what I meant to say. Now after all this is done, this is just one step. This is the first step. Uh, what have we calculated? So let's take a look at what outputs at this point are actually complete. That's what I meant to say. So at this point, we have x0 has its correct value. What about x1? Yeah, x1 is correct because we have x0 plus x1, that's indeed the correct output. What about x2? No, not yet. So this is still missing, x3. Yeah, we have x3 because thread one ended up calculating x0 dot 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 x3. So we have x3. We have x4, yes, no. Nope, no x4. x5, not yet. Actually, all we have is x4 plus x5. Likewise, we don't have x6. We do have x7. So that's done. So kind of just by looking at this and kind of extending the pattern to larger input, you could probably easily convince yourself that, okay, it's logarithmic in time, <clears throat> right? And what you 
you should probably be even able to convince yourself out of this. Um, that it's n, order n, in terms of operations, total, total number of additions. But we'll come back to that. Okay, but we're not done, because we still have to calculate x4, x5, x6, sorry, x2, x4, x5, and x6. Those are still missing. Okay, any questions on this, right? The, taking this pattern and putting it into code, we will do that. But kind of the pattern should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, question. They will be. We haven't finished calculating them yet, right? Because if we take a look at x2, for example, nothing here calculated x0 plus x1 plus x2, right? There's no thread that did that. We calculated x2 plus x3. Well, that doesn't help us. We calculated x0 plus x1. We never added x2 to it. So that's still not done. We're close, but not complete, right? Same thing with x3, uh, same thing with x4. Right? If we take a look at x4, well, we calculated x0, x, da, 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 we don't have x4 added to it yet. Okay, makes sense. Question. So is the way of the making here as opposed to the that makes the partial sum for the whole operation, so the finding partially yeah, I mean, what, what, what this is doing is it's, it's having the number of threads aggressively each, each time step, okay? But at the expense of not fully calculating the partial sum, right? There are some elements missing. The next step will fill in the gaps, okay? And when we fill in the gaps, what will happen is we'll also have a logarithmic number of steps. Yeah. A quick follow-up. So is it, is it any use to have those like whole sums calculated earlier? Get like x3 x. Oh, earlier than the rest of them? Yeah. You could. I mean, it may be, maybe there's a way to utilize that. But what we're doing for our particular purposes is saying that we need everything before we, we can move on. But you're right. We've calculated these earlier. Maybe that's helpful. Yes. I think it's a, a curiosity. Okay, it wasn't. It's not intentional. Any other? Yeah. Do we actually calculate all the threads in the previous one, but some of the entire array? Calculating the rest of the threads? You mean? Actually calculate that? Yeah, because those are primary outputs. Okay, so I think what you're saying is if all, we're, if all we care about is X7, we care about the other ones. Well, that's, that's just. What? What is that? It's a reduction. It's the reduction of the n inputs. Okay. What we're doing here, remember, scan is different than reduction. Scan is all the, the prefix reductions. The reduction of 0, the reduction of 1, the reduction of 2, 3, da, 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 da. Right? So it's all the reductions. <clears throat> and we know that, yeah, we can calculate this. In fact, we just did it, right? We just did MP 5.1 right here in this tree. Okay, cool. Now, let's talk about the next step. Call this the post-scan step. Okay, 
So now what we're going to concentrate on, right, we don't really care about the things we already calculated. We only care about the things that we haven't calculated. Okay, and just kind of let's stare at it for a moment. Um, so, well, in order for us to calculate x2, what I want to do is kind of add, add these two things together, right? Kind of add th these two things together. Calculated x4, I just want to add these two things together. Calculated in x5, a little more complicated, but I want to add these two things together. Calculated x6, I want to, in fact, x6 is the more complicated one because I want to add this plus that plus this together. Right? So some of these things are yeah, just one addition away from being complete. Some of them are two additions away. So let's start with a thing that's two additions away and say that, well, okay, first... I need to calculate x5, so that then I can calculate x6. It's x6 is the thing that's going to take long, but as a precursor, let's calculate x5. So we will have in the first step just one active thread. And we'll just kind of, for this particular example, place it there. Okay, and it's calculating x5, which, is, which was missing. And in fact, we're done with x5. But we're really calculating x5 because we know that x6 is going to take two steps. And might as well calculate it. Okay. So that in the next step, what we have... all the other ones that were just one addition away, right? X2, well, we just needed to take the output of X1 and add X2 to it. So, boom, that's done. X4, likewise, X3 plus X4. And we're done. And because we calculated X5, calculating X6, it was easy. What we did was we're effectively increasing the number of threads in the post-scan step. The scan step, the pre-scan step, the threads we're reducing. Here, we're increasing, but we're doing it in a very controlled manner. Okay. And if we drew this out for a larger set of data, kind of here's what it would look like. And you can see for n equal 8 kind of as a subset for n equal 16. But the larger pattern is here, right? The top is uh, it's kind of the nice-looking balanced tree. And the bottom is a balanced tree too, but the, the, it's kind of a little funky in the sense that it shifted a bit. But again, the top tree is conceptually easier than the bottom tree because of that shift. But it's an ad where kind of it's spread at the top with one thread, and we kind of bring the, the sums closer together, adding more threads all the time, where the last layer of threads is adding adjacent elements. Got a thread here calculating x0, x1, x2, adding adjacent elements. Thread 4, adding adjacent elements. Thread 6, thread 8, thread 12, I'm sorry, 10, 12, so forth. So every other thread. Actually, every thread, not every other thread. Every other thread and so on and so forth. We're kind of doing it backwards. Okay. 
Any questions on the pattern? We're going to write code to accomplish this. But that's the pattern overall. Yeah, question. The final goal, like if you're, if you're asking what is the, the final output here, okay? The final output is this is x0, this is x0 plus x1, x0 plus x1 plus x2. Not necessarily, because the threads are going to be doing different kinds of addition. It's just that on the final step, the output here. Need, we, I mean, this is thread one. Now, this could be thread zero. This could be thread one, thread two, thread three. So the thread numbers have nothing to do. This is important to keep in mind. Thread numbers don't have to correspond to the x zero or the x that's out here. Okay. Please keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah, if I have a dot, that's just somebody reading that value. So if you only read a value once it's finished, you it for the... Yes, the uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Let, let me write this down carefully, okay? Because you're, I, I want to make sure we're all... Um, uh, yeah, so let's view it that way. This is a read. And essentially, this is a write. Right? When, when we have a plus, that plus is writing that value. I know it's a little confusing in this kind of diagram, but that's what's happening. Okay, so we're writing x1 here. We're writing, writing x3 here. We're writing x7 here, writing x2, x4, okay, make sense? Yes, um, no, 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 make sure that's true. Yeah, in fact, that is true for this. Um, your observation is we never read a partial sum And I think that is true, right? So I think what you're saying is there's never a pattern in this particular diagram that looks like this, a read followed by a write, right? Yeah, that, that doesn't exist here. So the only values we read are complete actual outputs. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. It potentially takes longer. Yes. Yeah. Very good observation. Okay. We'll come. We'll come back to that. Okay. Any other questions on this notational view? We're gonna write it up as code next. Yes. Yes, that's a very good point. Can we come back to that? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. 
Okay, good. Let's move on. So if you're confused, you know, you're looking at this, you're saying, wow, that's pretty complicated. I get some of it, but I don't get all of it. Hang on. We're going to write the code. The code might help clear things up. But you can always come back to it, and you'll get some practice, at least with uh, MP 5.2. Okay, so let's talk about the pre-scan step. This is the first step. Okay, so we, to set it up, we have block size threads. Okay. So block size threads, but two times the block size inputs, right? So that's kind of the input, right? Just coming back here, this is the number of threads, but I have two, two times that as the number of inputs. Because essentially each, in each, set, each initial thread is adding two values together, right? That's the, the whole idea. All right, so um, let's, for example, just say block size is eight, just to keep this concrete. We'll set stride equal to one. And while stride is less than two, uh, two times block size, we're going to keep iterating through the loop. Okay, and as you can see down at the bottom, each time through the loop, we double block size, or we double stride. So essentially, you see that logarithmic pattern, right? It's going to take log n steps because of that. Now, within the loop, we remember the one key thing here, okay? And this is true with a lot of CUDA, actually parallel uh, algorithms, is the mapping between the data index. Right? The data index is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, dot, 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 15. And the thread index is up to us. So we could, for example, have decided, well, I'm going to make this thread 1, and this thread 3, and this thread 5, and this thread 15. Sorry, not x15. We could choose thread numberings based on whatever we want, right? That's our decision as, as, the, as an implementation in CUDA. So, and that affects the way we write our code. We are going to choose a thread mapping that's a little different. What we are going to say is this is thread 0 and thread 1 thread 2, and so on and so forth. So let's see how that all works out. Okay, so index, okay, where index is the output value that the thread is going to write is calculated by thread index plus 1 times stride times 2 minus 1. And just as a little side note, right, in our example, um, thread index x plus 1 would be 1 to 8. Stride would be 1. So we multiply it by 2 and then subtract 1. So thread index times thread index x plus 1 times 2 minus 1. So we would have our first index as 1, our second index as 3, and so on and so forth. So the indices that we're talking about corresponding to Thread uh, 
at zero through seven are one, three, five, seven, 15, okay? So what this means is if I go back to this diagram, it's just meaning, it's just the mapping between thread number, thread zero, maps to index one. Thread one maps to index three. Thread two, index five, and so on and so forth, okay? Again, we could have decided that thread mapping to be whatever we wanted it to be. Well, this is what we decided, and this is the code that it results in. Make sense? Questions on that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, so I, I'm gonna read into your question a bit, okay? I think what you're asking is, what if our input is very, very large? And, well, yeah, a block is defined to be a GPU execution entity, um, which, fine, that's what it is, but how do we deal with larger inputs? I think that's where you're going with your question. Good. So what we'll do is right now, we're gonna constrain everything by block size, okay? And then I'll show you by the end of the lecture, well, what if our input is much, much larger than the block size, okay? So that's coming, okay? That's your question, right? Good. Good, any questions about thread mapping to index? Again, it's arbitrary. We're trying to keep the code simple. So there we go. So now we've got index, right? Index is just the primary output. This is what the thread is writing. Okay, if that's what the thread is writing, what we need to do is make sure that we're in the bounds, right? Um, and then do the update. And then iterate. And that's the pre-scan step. Cool. So we did that. So this is done. That's the CUDA code for that piece. Now we gotta do the same thing for the bottom piece, which a little trick here, but as long as we see the pattern, it's not terribly bad. So in the post in, in fact in the post scan step, we're gonna start with one active thread and then increase until we get everything done. And again, here, the mapping to thread is entirely up to us. Okay. So in the post-scan step, um, what we want to do is, uh, again, map from indices I'm sorry, from thread IDs into indices. And what we'll do is again, have um, uh, the, the uh, you know, similar type of mapping here. Okay, so we're gonna start with stride, this time block size over two. And we're gonna divide stride by two until we're done. Similar structure. In fact, we're gonna calculate thread index very much the same way. Um, so thread index plus one, so if we have thread zero, one, two, three, plus one, and then stride starting at four, dividing all the way through. So stride starts at four, goes to two, goes to one. And what will happen is in the first iteration, um, uh, 
so by the way, in the first iteration, what we'll have is, in the first iteration, um, stride index x plus one times stride, which is four, times two, uh, so we're gonna multiply this by eight and then subtract one, so this will be seven, uh, did I do that right? Let's see. Uh, one times eight minus one, yes. So then um, thread one, its index will be two times eight, 16, 15. Thread two, it will be times eight, uh, 23, dot, 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 okay. So I'm just calculating the, the index that corresponds to each um, thread. Or stride equals four. And if we kind of carry this forward, what we're gonna realize is, hey, the only active thread here is um, is seven, because that that if condition index plus stride is only going to be true for that thread zero, thread one inactive, thread two inactive, all the other threads inactive, and it's only in the case where once stride is small enough do the other threads start to become active. So first iteration. The only thread that does anything is thread zero, right? So if I came back here, in fact, this is gonna be a good exam question. If I asked you to put a label on all these pluses, tell me which thread is doing the work. Which thread is doing this work? I love this question. I don't know why I never thought about it in all my years teaching this course. Sometimes, yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Five. Thread five. Thread five, yeah. I'm just, I just wanna know which thread is doing this one. I like how this is turning into a little bit of a puzzle. Okay, let me come back here. Okay, this is the post scan step, right? So the, the way we're calculating index is we're, we're going through this, right? That is the thing we are talking about right now. Thread index converting to index, all right? And what I said is, well, my natural thread numbers are zero through 15 because block size is eight. I'm sorry, block size is 16. Okay. I'm sorry, block size is eight, right? Block size is eight. So I don't have 15 threads. I only have eight threads. Um, so if I calculate T plus one, Right, which is t plus one is essentially this right here. Then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Stride for that very first iteration is four. So stride times two, which is which is this part right here, is eight. So what I want to do is add sorry, multiply t plus one by eight for all of them, and then subtract one. So what that does is thread zero, t plus one is one, which results in the full index calculation to be seven. So thread one, t 
Thread zero, index seven. Thread one, index 15. Thread two, index 23. Thread three, index 31, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now, that said, let's come back to my question. It's, which thread ID is calculating this? Yeah, thread zero. Okay, thread zero. Now if we go to the next iteration, which we will do in a moment, thread zero, thread zero. Okay, so this is a bit of an unusual pattern in this particular, this is not the way we've been doing it. But why not? Nothing stops us, right? You just, I, I, the reason I'm belaboring this a bit is because, again, you gotta think creatively sometimes when you're mapping things into parallel architectures like CUDA. The thread IDs don't have to correspond one-to-one -to, -one to the output elements, which has been the case with matrix multiply and convolution, but need not be the case. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, good, good. I don't know why it never occurred to me to even ask this before, but it, it's, it's, it's good. Um, Okay, so moving along. If we break this down a bit and we look at the asymptotic analysis of it, um, we've got two log n parallel, we've got two log n iterations. Pre-scan, log n, because we're doubling the number of threads in each iteration up to the limit. Whereas, for the post scan, we're dividing the number of iterations, oh, I'm sorry, the other way. We're, we're dividing the number of iterations by two for the pre-scan and multiplying the number of, iter of, of threads by two for the post scan. So those are both logarithmic, okay? And then if we look at the number of adds that we have, the number of active threads, we have n over two, then n over four, then one. That's the pre-scan step. And in the post-scan, right, so this is, pre-scan, and then Kind of the opposite of that, or the post scan. And if we sum them up, what we find is the amount of work we're doing is order n, not order n log n like we had with the Brent Kung approach. Okay. So, but the problem is we've got these two iterations. So really it's twice what we would do for the Brent Kung, I'm sorry, for the Kogi Stone, and actually twice what the most efficient serial algorithm will do. Um, I'm sorry, in the, in, the, in the total number of ads, right? The, uh, serial algorithm will only have n. Here, we're probably gonna have two n, just because of the two iterations. Okay, so, kind of that's what we have to worry about here. Um, by the way, any questions on that? Okay, now, this is where 
kind of the GPU constraints come in. Okay. What I was saying earlier is if I do this on a GPU, it's, I, I have to have a block, and I'm going to occupy that block for a logarithmic number of steps. So some amount of time, but all those threads are occupied. Okay. Yeah, and maybe if I were clever, I could find a way to kind of, you know, get those threads that are done quickly out of the way. But with CUDA, not that easy to do. Um, so, well, the Brent Kung approach, it's, you know, this little, this little pattern here times two, because I've got the top pattern and the bottom pattern, which are effectively the same. And what I'm doing is I'm putting threads, essentially making them idle faster. I'm putting more threads idle in those logarithmic steps than I am here. And that's why we get that benefit, because there are more threads doing nothing. But on a GPU, it's hard for me to use that, because those threads, I can't remap them to other work if they've already been allocated to a thread. Okay, so this, if we're talking about general parallelism, is nice, but because of the constraints put on by GPUs, hard to make use of the advantage there. Okay, so what you'll find is, um, you know, like even if you look at the CUDA implementations, like the CUDA library for prefix sum or scan, they use Kogi Stone. Question. Well, it's a good question. Okay, so uh, I've got. Like, let's let's take this, okay? Kind of imagine a big version of it, a big block of that. Thousand elements, two thousand elements. Okay, his point is a good one. His point is, okay, look, in some of the iterations, I'm gonna have a bunch of warps that are doing nothing. Right, so they finish quickly because they're doing nothing. Some warps are doing additions. And they may take time because additions take time. So is there a benefit for having those warps that do nothing? Can I do something with them? What's the answer? I can't deallocate the block until the last warp is done, right? So effectively, those warps just are there doing nothing waiting for the warps that are still doing something to finish what they're doing so that I can then say, okay, this block is done. Make sense? So it's hard for me to make use of those. So again, that's my point that, you know, Kogi Stone, simple algorithm, one step, doesn't have these two steps. It's probably the best we're gonna be able to do on a GPU. Any other questions on this? Because now we're going to deal with her question, which is, what if we have millions of input elements that we want to calculate the prefix, prefix scan of or scan of? Um, how do we do that? Okay, well, let's talk about that. And it turns out something very nice happens here. Okay, so for example, let's say I've got this initial array of arbitrary length, or just very, very large length. So what I can do is I can use a hierarchical approach here, okay? So I divide it into blocks, many, the, many blocks. So each block is calculating a prefix sum, a prefix scan or scan, I keep calling it scan. I scan, I scan, I scan, I scan. Okay. And the only one that's correct at this point is block zero. Right? 
Block one is wrong and block two is wrong and block three is wrong. But they're not arbitrarily wrong. They're actually partially correct. So let's talk about that. Okay, so scan of block one is really the, the scan of the elements starting with that first element of block one. And what's it, what it's missing is really what is the sum of all the elements in block zero, which is the reduction of block zero, which is the last element of block zero. Okay. And likewise, if I take the nth block, it's dependent on n minus one, which is dependent on n minus two, which is dependent on so on and so forth. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the last element of all the scans of each scan and write them into an auxiliary array in global memory. So when each block is done, it writes its output into global memory and then takes the nth element that it generated and writes them into an auxiliary array right there. Okay? Then what we'll do is we'll run scan on that thing. Because in order for us to calculate the nth block, or the kth block, I don't want to re overuse n, I need the reduction of all the k blocks prior to it, k minus one blocks prior to it, which is really just the scan of this thing, the kth element in the scan of this thing. So I take that, I scan that, I generate this output, and then I take the elements and I just add them into the output. So for example, this is block zero, the output of block zero, don't need to touch it, it's correct. This is the output of block one, and I just need to take this element and add that scalar value to all those elements. This element, scalar add to all those elements, and so forth and so on. Okay. So this will be our first, by the way, we've got the scan kernel up at the top. The scan kernel applied again here on this intermediate or auxiliary array. And then another kernel, very simple kernel, right? You can kind of completely imagine it in your mind at this point, I hope, to add a single scalar value to an array of values. Right? We've got, this is our first example of a multi-kernel uh, piece of code. Sense? Any questions about this? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Exactly right. So his point is, well, I'm assuming that this thing, or sorry, this thing right here will fit into a block. Right? And if it does, great, then. But if it doesn't, and I gotta do this all over again. Right, and yeah, I mean, in reality, you've gotta be ready for that. Okay, but the, lucky, the, the good thing is, the hierarchical approach makes that work. It's actually quite trivial to make that work well. Okay, good, any other questions? Okay, so now, one thing. So let's take a look at that first step. So I do this. So 
Okay, this step right here, this is just our scan curl. Um, and then I've got our scan kernel here, right? Um, so the scan kernel, the first one, bunch of blocks, the you know, they, they get scheduled on the, the SMs. The SMs do their work. The SMs write global memory. And then let's say I launch the second scan kernel. But I need a guarantee. I need to make sure something is true before I start that second scan kernel. And kind of what I want you to think about is sync threads. How do I launch a kernel? Well, I just call it in my code, right? I call the kernel. And in, let's assume these kernels are asynchronous. I call them, boom, they go. My code continues, and maybe the next thing in my code is launch scan kernel again with these parameters. What's the problem with that? Yeah. need to make sure the first scan is done and all the values of that scan are in a place where the second scan expects to find them, which is global memory. Okay, so what we need is kind of an implicit sync threads between them and a flush. Like, if there's any data that's buffered on the GPU, no, it's got to be all written out to global memory at that point. Otherwise, there's a danger that if I start this scan, that some value that's old and stale will be written by that scan, will be read by that scan. And likewise, the same is true for add kernel that follows. So you can imagine in the host code, scan, scan, add, is what we would expect to put in our code for this kind of uh, at least two-stage uh, hierarchical scan. What we want CUDA to do, the right thing, is to make sure everything is flushed and done before that second kernel starts, or the third kernel starts. And indeed, with CUDA, the only way, actually, to guarantee that everything is out of the GPU is to launch another kernel. So essentially, kernels are what we call these memory fences, this idea of a memory fence, that if I have a read, well, memory fence idea is very simple. If I have a, got at time A, write X, and at time B, read X. That sometimes, because everything's happening in parallel, this read X might happen before that write X. Okay. Except what CUDA will guarantee is if there's a kernel launch, there's an implicit memory fence between them so that this read will be guaranteed to happen after the right X because of the memory fence. Okay, and the memory fence from a hardware perspective is easy. Kernel ends, all the data needs to be written, right? If the thread does a write, no, it can't be on some buffer, uh, you know, on the memory interface. Nope, it's gotta be out of the chip and written into the global memory. Question. It's more than a sync threads, right? Because the sync threads only pertains to shared memory. This is like a sync threads that's across the entire chip. Better way to do that. 
You know, I'm, I, the old versions of CUDA, the only way to do it is by doing a kernel end and a kernel launch. I don't know in the new, the new variations of CUDA whether there's a global chip memory fence. Question. Yeah, so th th this is done explicitly at the end when we're transferring data from the CPU, the GPU back to the CPU, right? Because we don't have a second kernel we're launching, right? This is all my kernels are done. I want the results. It's synchronizing the CPU with the GPU, okay? If that makes sense. Here, we don't have to do the synchronize, right? The launch of the second kernel is an implicit synchronization. Yes. What if you wanted to launch two independent kernels at once? Um, no, I think you will get an implicit fence between them. Um, I say that, but I, there's, there's some boundary conditions. I think there's a way for you to not do the fence in between them. That's something I'll have to go and look up. Okay, okay, good. So, that is it. I think that's all I really had to say today. Um, I guess just for completeness, um, there's this idea of an exclusive scan, which is trivial, it's just saying, um, if this is my input, I'm starting at zero, and I'm kind of adding over one. Um, and that's sometimes the types of scans we want to do, but it is very easy to handle in our kernel just by offsetting the threads by one. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, unfortunately, we have to write everything to global memory. So yes. In order to break the memory fence. Yes. And they cannot just. What do we need to make? You're right. We don't have to, but we have to make the, the auxiliary array visible to all other blocks. Right. Think about it. Think about it. Um, why don't we stop here? Now, as a pre, this give you a little preview. Uh, what we're going to start talking about next week is this idea of histogramming, which I have a lot of experience with histogramming, and I'll, I'll tell you a few uh, anecdotal examples. Um, and, and similar to what we're talking about here, we can take multi-kernel approaches to it, uh, but it's a big problem to do in parallel. And we'll talk about why next time, okay? Any questions before we stop for today? Yes. Yes, 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 that's a very good point. If, yeah, I like this. If our metric was total energy consumed, okay, for doing a reduction or a scan, sorry, scan, what we might find is the Brent Kung approach might be better than the Kogi Stone approach, right? Because we've got a lot more threads idle than we do with um, the Kogi Stone approach. Now, not clear to me that it will 
go that way, right? Because we, it depends on how the GPU architects actually implement the idleness, right? Is it less power to do nothing? We would hope so, than to do the actual addition. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Good, any other questions? Cool, okay, so let's reconvene uh, Tuesday next week. Thank you.